Good afternoon and happy Monday, everyone. I'm Dr. Michael Reinhardt, the director of the Brooklyn Initiative to Develop Geriatrics Education, or BRIDGE for short. It's my pleasure to welcome you today for this session on hearing impairment in the elderly, an important clinical entity that affects social and clinical outcomes of our older patients. This lecture is given in support of the activities of our BRIDGE program, and well, as well as the new advanced certificate program in public health geriatrics in our School of Public Health. The Brooklyn Initiative to Develop Geriatrics Education is funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration as part of their Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. The Bridge Program was developed in partnership between four of the colleges and schools at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University, including the College of Medicine, College of Nursing, School of Public Health, and School of Health Professions. This truly interprofessional partnership of our colleges and schools is complemented by our outstanding partners in the community, including the New York City Health and Hospitals Kings County, Brownsville Multi-Service Family Health Center, and the Fort Greene Council, and their network of 13 senior centers throughout the borough of Brooklyn. The overall goal of the Bridge Program is to provide the education and support needed for Brooklyn to become an age and dementia-friendly place for our senior neighbors to obtain their health care. It is our pleasure today to welcome Dr. John Weigand to speak on the important topic of hearing impairment in the elderly. Dr. John Weigand is a well-known audiologist who has been serving the Brooklyn community since 1998. He has been Division Chief of Audiology at SUNY Downstate since May of 2000 and is a New York State Registered Hearing Aid Dispenser, proud member of the American Academy of Audiology, and the New York Speech Language Hearing Association, as well as the American Speech Language Hearing Association. He is a native of Queens, New York, and is a graduate of Archbishop, Archbishop Malloy High School and Queens College. After graduating from college, Dr. Wigand excelled at St. John's University, completing his Master's of Arts program and furthered his education by achieving a doctorate in clinical audiology at the University of Florida. Dr. Wigand completed his practicum training at the Manhattan Eye and Ear and Throat Hospital and the Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Prior to earning his New York State Audiology and Hearing Instrument Dispensing Licenses, Dr. Wigand completed clinical fellowship at the Long Island College Hospital, where he received extensive training in pediatric audiology, including fitting hearing impaired children with hearing devices and collaborating with surgeons in the operating room during cochlear implant procedures. <clears throat> During his career, Dr. Wigand has become an active member of the community. He is an avid speaker and presenter and has provided numerous educational sessions <clears throat> and courses to fellow practitioners and patient groups at various venues. His office offers complimentary hearing screenings throughout the community and has participated at numerous health fairs. He has appeared on several local televised medical programs and submitted articles to local newspapers Dr. Wigand was previously recognized by the Fort Greene Council for Outstanding Community Service. A great achievement of his is the creation of the resident training for rising audiologists. To date, he has trained over 100 students throughout a variety of clinical settings and has continued to expand community services by providing care at several outside private practice locations. Thank you, Dr. Wigand. We look forward to your talk today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Donovan, for the opportunity to uh, present to all of you today. Okay, I'm Dr. John Wigand, looking forward to uh, presenting this topic to you. Okay, um, so the uh, goal of our pro uh, program today is to demonstrate general knowledge of audiology and the role of healthy hearing in improving quality interdisciplinary care across the care continuum to understand the impact of current events on the audiovestibular system, identify and leverage common audiological misconceptions to aid in the eradication of ageism, subsequently improving patient quality of life and health care delivery. Okay, so uh, I feel uh, very lucky to have been at Downstate for over 21 years and treated over 50,000 patients uh, during my time, but I cannot do it alone, so I want to acknowledge the team of professionals that works with me that help uh, our office and our practice run at a very high level. Um, Dr. Anastasia Golden, Dr. Monica Skarzynski, Dr. Megan Weiner, Dr. Kirsten Clifton. Uh, these are all of the uh, audiologists that I count on and collaborate with on a daily basis, as well as, um, very importantly, uh, Ms. Tamika Thomas, 
and Mr. David Tonkowicz. These are practice managers that are keeping everything running behind the scenes. And we also have six audiology residents from various universities that we are training for what's known as their fourth year. It's a uh, final year of clinical training. Okay, so um, an audiologist is a healthcare provider who provides patient-centered care in the prevention, identification, diagnosis, and evidence-based treatment of hearing, balance, and other auditory disorders for all ages. We navigate complex medical, psychological, physical, social, educational, and occupational needs. We maintain knowledge of existing and emerging technologies, current research, and interpersonal counseling skills. Our role in healthcare is that we help change the course of cognitive decline for patients, reduce the risk of falls, promote education, literacy, and employment, prevent social isolation and loneliness, decrease depression and anxiety, decrease medically adverse events, hospitalizations, and readmissions, and this is estimated to save the healthcare system over $3 billion every year. Um, anatomy of the ear. Uh, on the um, outer ear, okay, uh, shown in the slide here is the ear flap. That is the portion that's visible externally. When we look in the ear, we see the ear canal uh, where we see earwax. Sometimes the end of the ear canal is the eardrum. When sound uh, touches the eardrum or stimulates the eardrum, it vibrates creating a chain reaction to the ossicles. Those are the three smallest bones in the body and they in turn send a uh, fluid pressure wave through the cochlea, that's the organ of hearing, and ultimately the stimulation of the hair cells inside of the cochlea sends information to the nerve of hearing that goes up to the brain. The other part of the inner ear is uh, the three semicircular canals, okay, and those make up the vestibular portion of the inner ear. Okay, so uh, fun fact, the three ossicles, if they were uh, placed on the seat of an orange, all three of them at the same time would fit on that orange seat. So it just gives us perspective as how small those structures are and um, really how amazing it is that such a small structure within the body can give us so much and really uh, work as a very uh, important component of the sense of hearing. Um, statistically, uh, the incidence of hearing loss for every thousand babies that's born, um, about two or three of them have some level of measurable hearing loss. Ninety percent of deaf children are born to hearing parents. Fifteen percent of Americans age 18 and up report some degree or some trouble with hearing. That's over 37 million people. Age is the strongest predictor of hearing loss and the um, decade in the, in the 60s, age 60 to 69, has the most people with measurable hearing loss in it uh, presently. 2% of adults age 45 to 54 have disabling hearing loss and this rate increases uh, for adults age 55 to 64. Okay, um, risk factors for hearing loss um, are age, family, hearing loss or genetics, noise exposure, certain medications like aminoglycosides and um, some of the chemotherapy medications. Diabetes and hypertension have a negative effect on the hearing system because these diseases interrupt the blood supply in the microvascular system of the cochlea. And men tend to have a higher incidence of hearing loss than women, um, primarily because of occupational and potentially military noise exposure. Okay. Some comorbidities of hearing loss are dizziness and vertigo, tinnitus and hyperacusis. Some psychiatric conditions associated with hearing loss are depression, anxiety, and loneliness, as well as cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, loneliness um, is really being looked at as its own health condition. Um, Dr. Murthy, who was the former general, uh, Surgeon General under the Obama administration, has published uh, some well-regarded research in this area. Um, from his research, um, we see that 35% of adults over the age of 45 report some level of loneliness. Uh, this is a risk factor for premature death, and statistically it can be as harmful as smoking 15 cigarettes on a daily basis. Um, basic human needs are water, food, and people. Okay, of course we need water and food to sustain our bodies. 
we need people to sustain ourselves emotionally. Okay, it's the human connection um, in many times, difficult times, that really keeps us going. Okay, knowing that someone is looking out for us, someone that we have to look out for, that's uh, quite often what keeps us waking up in the morning. Okay, um, if someone loses that connection to people because of loneliness, it increases their underlying level of stress. Um, increased stress at a baseline uh, can produce cortisol. That's a stress hormone. And if the person experiencing this has an increased level of baseline cortisol, it can lead to other health problems. Um, for example, the reduced perception of pain, increased blood pressure, which can um, increase the heart rate, and then increased blood sugar as well, which leads to more inflammation, higher risk of cancer, uh, diabetes, and high blood pressure, okay? So loneliness leads to potentially other health problems. Um, the effect of cortisol on the brain, uh, cortisol is affected by uh, or activated by the sympathetic nervous system, that's the fight or flight nervous system. Uh, chronic increases in cortisol affect the prefrontal section of the brain. That's the part of the brain that gives us filters and judgment. Okay, so people in this category may seem persistently aggressive and distrustful. They may be perceived as not being fun to be around and less attractive as social partners. And then it's a spiral effect, right? So loneliness begets loneliness. Um, perhaps reduced social interaction is associated with dementia. And then the lower social interaction means that the brain is tasked less. So there's less cognitive tasking happening uh, in someone with loneliness, okay? Um, loneliness as a medical condition. So what happens to the brain leading to neuronal cell death and dementia? Um, there are MRIs that have shown that adults with loneliness have decreased brain volume. And there are several hypotheses to this. The damage from cortisol and frequent hypertension ultimately damage brain cells. Perhaps lower social interaction and reduced cognitive activity lead to physical changes in the brain. Um, for people with hearing loss, it's hypothesized that distorted sound and reduced access to sound uh, uh, because of that hearing loss leads to physical changes. It's estimated that 20% of people with untreated hearing loss uh, report loneliness. Okay, so uh, Duzel published a study back in 2019 that looked at brain volume and was able to establish objectively that the uh, size of the brain changes with chronic loneliness. Um, different causes of loneliness, some are reversible and some are non-reversible. Okay, looking at the non-reversible first is age, of course. Uh, being female, women have a longer life expectancy than men, so men pass on first leave the women behind, leading to loneliness. Living in a rural area, just not having people around can lead to loneliness. Lower education, poor health status, and then of course uh, being in quarantine. Reversible causes of loneliness um, can be uh, decreased vision and decreased hearing. So if someone has a problem with vision, quite often it can be treated with corrective lenses or eye surgery or medication. Uh, with hearing, Okay, decreased hearing can be treated medically. Perhaps it's just simple earwax. Perhaps a person needs surgery to regain hearing. Perhaps they need a device like a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. But in most cases, there's something that can, can, be, done, can be done. So it's important to keep in mind that it's our brain that hears, not our ears. Okay, hearing serves many purposes. It keeps us safe, gives us environmental awareness. It helps us localize the direction of sounds and then also helps us to understand speech in noisy backgrounds. Living with hearing loss is tiring and it affects people's memory, okay? Um, so when we have hearing loss, it takes the brain more effort, uh, is required to follow and understand. The brain has to work harder to fill in the gaps of hearing. More mental resources are required that can make one feel tired. Compensating for hearing loss leaves less energy available for memory and information recall. Um, good hearing reduces the workload on the brain. Okay, uh, there was a um, very well-known study that came out about 10 years ago. It's called the um, Hearing Loss and Cognition in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of the Aging. 
Dr. Lin is one of the lead investigators. Uh, he's an ENT physician. The objective was to determine the relationship between hearing loss and cognitive function. He hypothesized that greater hearing loss is associated with lower cognitive test scores on tests of memory and executive function. Okay, um, and the findings did support that hypothesis. Greater hearing loss was significantly associated with lower scores on measures of mental status. A reduction in cognitive performance associated with a 25 decibel change in hearing was equivalent to reduced associate to the reduction associated with an age difference of 6.8 years on the um, mental status exam. So, for example, if my twin brother and I enroll at this uh, in this study at the age of 65, we get our hearing tested, and we do the cognitive battery, we both get a score. Okay, let's say our hearing is both normal at that time. Five years go by, we're back at the age of 70. We do these tests again. Let's say his hearing has stayed normal. My hearing has decreased by uh, one standard deviation according to the study, which would be 25 decibels. My cognitive test scores indicate that I'm functioning as someone who's almost 77 years old, not 70 years old. So it was a um, way of documenting or proving the correlation between untreated hearing loss and changes in cognitive abilities. Okay, um, dementia will double. Okay, these are some uh, hard facts. So in 2016, the global number of individuals living with dementia was about 44 million, and this was up from 20 million in 1990. About 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's presently. By 2050, this number is projected to rise uh, to about 14 million. Hearing loss has been found to, in to be independently associated with accelerated cognitive decline in elderly adults. The opposite statistical trend is observed in participants that used hearing aids. Um, cognitive decline for those who used hearing aids was not significantly different for those without hearing loss. Okay, so it is important to say that um, will getting a hearing aid prevent cognitive decline? We would not say that. Um, what we would say is that we can manage a condition that's manageable while we help the patient deal with something that's less manageable. Okay, so if we can manage the hearing loss, at least we're making it easier for that patient to communicate while they're going through a challenge like cognitive impairment or dementia. And it also makes it easier for their family members and people taking care of them, okay? Um, there's also an association between hearing loss uh, and dizziness or imbalance. There's an anatomical proximity, a shared nerve, the eighth cranial nerve, is um, associated with both hearing and balance. People with mild hearing loss are three times more likely to have a history of falling. Every additional 10 decibels of hearing loss increases the chance of falling by 1.4 times. Um, we have uh, an example that I discuss. It's the, I call it the hallway example. So let's say someone is walking in the hallway in a school um, and the school has a very shiny hard floor and the person is walking with shoes, like dress shoes, and they're gonna hear their footsteps with every, every footstep, they'll hear it. They, if they had their eyes closed, they were walking down this hallway and they walked past an open door, the sound of their footstep would be different than if they walked past a closed door, okay? So I think that's an example that most people can relate to. And um, hopefully that example will illustrate the fact that environmental sounds give us information about our, our, our environment, okay? Like basically where we are. So think of a blind person tapping a cane. They tap the cane uh, not only to get the feeling, but to get the sound, to hear the tap, tap, tap. If they tap it next to a wall or in an open space or in their kitchen, they're going to get a different quality of the way it sounds to them, and that's going to give them information about their environment. So imagine losing that. You also lose some safety information that hearing is giving you. Okay. Consequences of untreated hearing loss. Um, adults with untreated hearing loss experience 30 to 40 percent faster decline in their cognitive abilities and are likely to develop dementia. 12 percent of those over age 50 report hearing loss that is significant enough to reduce their understanding of their treatment plan uh, when they're getting medical advice. And this group has a 32 percent higher rate of hospital readmission. Uh, and that's from the, uh, statistically from the American Geriatric Society. 
The cost impact of untreated hearing loss over 10 years is about $22,000 per person in additional medical expenses. Um, benefits of appropriate amplification, okay. Uh, increased safety, greater independence, better communication with uh, friends and family, better communication with health care providers, reduced perception of tinnitus, mitigation of cognitive decline, overall improvement of uh, self-confidence and quality of life. Um, so thinking about when to refer a patient, okay, for services for the ear, for the hearing, um, of course you know that audiology and ENT work hand in hand. Um, when to refer first to ENT, ENT obviously is the medical provider, so um, when you have a medical complaint, like pain or pressure in the ear, oral drainage, or tinnitus ringing in the ear, rapid onset symptoms, unilateral symptoms, a uh, suspected infection or a history of head trauma, it would be appropriate to refer patients with those concerns to the ENT first. Audiology, um, patients can come directly to us with complaints of progressive hearing loss, um, tinnitus, reduced word understanding, or the complaint if their family is um, noticing that they're having problems communicating or that their hearing is changing, right? Because it's quite often it's other people that notice our hearing is changing even before we do ourselves. So typically um, patients have a lack of awareness that their hearing is changing. Uh, presently only about 30% of people with hearing loss are using hearing aids. When they come for the initial testing, it's frequently because a family member is uh, prodding them to come in or there's a precipitating event. Um, a precipitating event to me is like making a mistake in a work setting because of not hearing well. Um, I have a patient that told me he picked up his son at the airport, but he got there at the wrong time because of his hearing. So that prompted him to come in to get it checked. Uh, some patients will have a difficulty integrating or accepting the diagnosis of changing hearing, and they may um, overgeneralize it or blame other people for them not hearing well. Most people wait about seven to 10 years after a hearing loss diagnosis to pursue hearing aids. They, um, those that eventually move forward, certain factors involved in that decision is, um, will their insurance cover it? Uh, perhaps there's a cost sharing um, method that's been put into place by their insurance company. They have to see themselves as using hearing aids and then take the step to do it, right? Every time we make a decision in life, it has to be done at least twice once internally. We have to decide to do something and then we take the step to do it. And then they have to make a commitment to coming back for their follow-up appointments uh, to make sure that things are moving in the right direction. Um, ideally, uh, what doesn't always happen, but what we would like to happen is that patients would have regular hearing screenings um, and this would be done uh, usually at the primary care's office. They would be appropriately referred by their primary physician to an ENT or an audiologist after failing a screening. They would bring a companion to share the experience. They would be open-minded to the results of the diagnosis, um, to the communication strategies presented by the audiologist, and then to review treatment options. They would enthusiastically agree to try uh, hearing aids. They would return for follow-up with questions and requests for fine-tuning, uh, reporting significant benefit from the technology and the appointments, okay, because you need both and then return for regular device uh, maintenance and service and testing on um, an annual basis at least. Okay, um, some communication strategies for healthcare providers, uh, make eye contact with your patient. Okay, we are all uh, encouraged or really required to write very uh, detailed notes about everything that we do in our electronic medical record, but it's also important to make eye contact, especially in the days of wearing masks. Using verbal verification, that's when you ask someone to repeat something back to you to make sure that they understand it. Giving information in writing, um, like the diagnosis, instructions, follow-up plan, and medication details, and then also getting the companion or the caregiver involved. Okay, um, some basic stats about healthcare in Brooklyn. Um, as uh, most of us know, we are in an area of Brooklyn that is considered an underserved area for healthcare. So statistically, the life expectancy in central Brooklyn is approximately six years lower than the NYC average. 
Hospitalization for conditions such as diabetes, asthma, and other life-threatening conditions are double um, in our area than in the New York City average. In 2019, the poverty rate in Brooklyn was um, about 18% compared to this entire state, which is about 13%. Kings County encompasses many neighborhoods that the Health Resources and Services Administration has deemed as medically underserved, and a shortage of providers exists in uh, primary care, mental health, mental health facilities, and also dentists. Okay, so reflection. Um, how will I use audiology as a tool to improve care delivery and subsequent patient quality of life across the care continuum? Okay, so certain hot topics in audiology, of course, uh, COVID-19, the aging population, Medicare, what are they covering these days? What about other insurance coverage uh, for testing and, and hearing aids and other treatment? And then over-the-counter hearing aids and technology, okay? So, of course, we all know about wearing masks and the um, uh, challenges, communicating with someone wearing a mask, right? So when someone's wearing a mask and talking to us, we don't see their faces. It's hard, it's impossible to read their lips. During some appointments, we have to go to wearing a face shield or even a clear mask like you can see here in the slide. Um, and patients, uh, many of our patients do rely on hearing as well as lip reading to communicate. Okay, there was a study that was published in, uh, back in 2017 BC before COVID. And this study looked at where people make eye contact based on their hearing. And the findings of the study were pretty intuitive. People who hear well, tend to make better eye contact with their conversation partner, whereas people who don't hear as well tend to make uh, contact with their, their eyes looking at the person's mouth to get the, uh, the visuals. Okay, so it's a pretty intuitive study, but we wanted to include it here. It actually came out before COVID. Um, so we found a, a solution to increase compatibility with masks and hearing aids. Okay, so Certain types of hearing aids do not um, combine themselves to wear well with masks because they're competing for space over the ear. And you can see that they have these mask straps. We probably have given out over 500 of them, at least um, during our appointments. We give them out to patients so that they can wear the mask off the ears. And um, sometimes I think it's the best part of the whole appointment. They, uh, they say we save their ears and they, they feel a relief not having the mask pulling on the ears. Okay, um, speech droplets. Uh, so there was a study that came out um, back in uh, May of 2020 that looked at the effect of, or the combination of hearing loss and the transmission of speech droplets. And the fact that People who don't hear well sometimes speak more loudly, can project speech droplets at a greater distance, and then those speech droplets will hang in the air for a longer time than if someone is speaking at a more average tone or, or an average volume. Also, when we speak to someone who doesn't hear well, it can uh, lead to us speaking more loudly and us ourselves projecting the droplets more. This would be, of course, uh, without wearing a mask. So. Um, the idea is that hearing loss can be related to increased transmission of airborne viruses like COVID because of the projection and uh, proliferation of speech droplets. Okay, um, there is also uh, seemingly a connection between tinnitus and COVID. Tinnitus, of course, is a sound perceived in the ear that is not actually being produced in the environment. Okay, it's uh, something that people perceive inside. More, uh, most people perceive a ringing in the ear, but others hear a buzzing, whooshing, and or a musical sound. The International Journal of Audiology estimates that about 7.5% of people infected with COVID experienced hearing loss, and about 15% of them uh, suffered with tinnitus. About 7% reported rotary vertigo, okay? And the British, British uh, Tinnitus Association reported a 16% increase in phone calls to their tinnitus helpline and a 256% um, rise in helpline uh, video chats from May into December of 2020. Uh, more research is needed, of course, to further examine the relationship. Um, still, it is uh, it's interesting to consider. Okay, so reflection. 
what is the COVID-19 and hearing loss, what's the connection? Um, so every healthcare talk uh, should include some aspect of the population, the aging population. Uh, baby boomers, of course, um, are uh, older age these days. Uh, they have a longer predicted lifespan and they view themselves as 10 to 15 years younger than they actually are. By 2035, the U.S. will have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. Okay, so we've heard this phrase, the graying of America. We've, we've been hearing about this for quite a while. The 65 and up population grew about 3% from 2018 to 2019. Folks in this age group, they want to age in place, feel young and healthy, and feel with it. So aging in place means that they want to stay in their homes. They don't want to have to go to a uh, nursing facility or retirement home or assisted living. They want improved health span, meaning that they want to take charge of their health. They tend to be more proactive um, and uh, increasing health span, not just increasing lifespan. So health span, of course, refers to your quality of health, hopefully in your long life to come. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, looking at Medicare, um, because most of the folks in this age group will have Medicare as their primary uh, health coverage. Um, Medicare does not cover routine hearing testing presently, uh, standalone Medicare. Some of the uh, third-party administrators of Medicare might, but st still to this day, Medicare requires a physician referral for someone to come in for a hearing test. Um, and it has to be complaint-driven. So that means either the primary physician is concerned about the patient's hearing or the person themselves is complaining of hearing or some other ear complaint that is prompting the referral to audiology, okay? So the question should be asked, um, is this ageism? Because for babies, newborn hearing screening is the law of the land and it's been the law of the land uh, in most states for over 20 years, okay? So every baby that is born in a hospital has to be have their uh, ears checked, their hearing screened before they're discharged. So why are we putting such a focus on good hearing for babies, but maybe not making the same investment in hearing for our folks in the retirement age or post-retirement age? Okay, so it could be seen as a form of ageism. Um, there are two audiograms here on the page. Uh, the one on the left shows normal hearing. Uh, the circles represent the right ear. The X's represent the left ear, okay? And any mark that is seen above the um, imaginary line of 25 between 20 and 30 is considered normal hearing. To the right, we see a um, normal hearing in the low frequency sloping to a moderate high frequency hearing loss. And this is a very typical audiogram that we might see clinically in someone whose uh, retirement age may be late 60s, early 70s, okay, it's, it's very common. So some providers, uh, even some patients themselves will say, well, my hearing is normal for my age, I'm 75, I'm expected to have some hearing loss, I'll leave it alone. And I think there are even some providers out there who may have the same attitude, but hopefully through sessions like this, we can start to change that. Um, there is no such thing as normal hearing for someone's age. Either someone has normal hearing or they don't. Um, if a little baby had the hearing loss like you see on the right side there, alarm bells would be going off. We would be referring this child for all sorts of interventions and it would be of the utmost importance that the child is not missed, okay? So um, keep that in mind. There's no such thing as normal hearing for your age. Either your hearing is normal or it isn't. Just because something is common doesn't mean we should ignore it. Um, high, high blood pressure can be very common for many people as they get older. It doesn't mean it gets ignored. Cataracts also are common for many people post-retirement age, but it doesn't mean that we should ignore them. Uh, quite often people are very proactive at managing that. So we should really look at hearing in the same light. Okay, um, hearing aids and cost sharing. So most of the insurances um, that, uh, that we work with and that are out there have at least some coverage for hearing aids or they will cover part of it. And the uh, term that we hear about a lot these days is cost sharing. Medicare as a standalone does not have a hearing aid benefit. Um, nationwide, the average for someone that um, is getting hearing aids and treatment at the retail level 
is typically between four and five thousand dollars for a pair of hearing aids, and um, that will typically also include all of the appointments necessary for the management of uh, those hearing aids and that patient for typically about four years. So on the average, it's about $20 a week to manage a chronic health crisis to, and also to have the services of a full service office and a qualified audiologist uh, at your disposal. Um, over-the-counter hearing aids and personal sound amplifying products. Okay, these are primarily uh, purchased online. They've been available for a long time. Um, President Biden recently issued an executive order that stated um, within uh, the next 120 days from July that HHS needs to issue proposed rules to allow hearing aids to be sold over-the-counter. And um, today about six in 10 personal amplifying products uh, patients using these devices are using them on a daily basis. Um, hearing aids overall, uh, the data is good, uh, reported that satisfaction is rising. 83% of hearing aid users surveyed reported that they're satisfied with their hearing aids. Nine out of 10 hearing aid users are more likely to recommend hearing aids and their provider to appear. Okay, so quite often when people get involved with hearing aids, they realize that having a qualified professional to guide them through the process is very important. 72 percent of non-users of hearing aids said they would consider purchasing online and 38 percent stated that they would want the latest technology plus professional service. Okay, so you're going to have a group of patients that will try it maybe by themselves first, getting something online and then um, quite often they will seek out professional help. It's like if someone is getting a um, the beginnings of carpal tunnel syndrome, they feel something happening in their wrist, they may start with painkillers and then a brace uh, that they'll pick up at the pharmacy to give themselves a little support. Ultimately, as that condition progresses, they're going to need medical attention. Okay, so over-the-counter hearing aids, over-the-counter solutions. Um, one of the questions uh, that we had is, will insurance cover over-the-counter? Because we have quite a few patients that we deal with that get hearing aids at no cost to them. So could these insurance companies a year or two down the road look at the fact now that more hearing aids are available over the counter and say to the patient, well, they can just get it themselves, why should we keep covering it? And then the burden is really on the patient. So instead of something that's helping the patient, it could actually hurt them. Um, who will test the patient's hearing when they get an over-the-counter device? Who will monitor the progress and success of the fitting? Um, one of the things that uh, most patients appreciate is a complete hearing healthcare model where all of the appointments and services are included as part of the, uh, the investment in the treatment plan. Okay, many of today's hearing aids um, can also be looked at as lifestyle enhancement devices. Most of them are compatible with smartphones for direct streaming and then the smartphones also have an app that allows the user to control the volume and different program settings in the hearing aids. Uh, some hearing aids are moving almost into the category of general wellness products. Uh, some have the ability to um, send an alert to the person's companion if the uh, technology in the hearing aid detects that the person may have fallen. There are optical sensors in some hearing aids that measure heart rate, steps, and even social engagement. Okay, so there's one lab out there that the computer in the hearing aid monitors the amount of time that the person is spending listening to a human voice and it gives the patient a social engagement score at the end of the day. Okay, so that circles back to this concept of social interaction being important to reduce loneliness and then also to increase this um, level of cognitive stimulation and social interaction. Uh, there's also some research going into looking at the quality of the human voice um, as it's related to other health conditions. Okay, so if uh, someone is slurring their words or elongating their sounds, it could be a sign that they're having a stroke. Um, okay, it could also be a sign maybe that their mental health is changing. They could be depressed um, or have, uh, you know, a traumatic brain injury. So also um, people who would be in a manic episode could be potentially speaking at a very quick rate. Some myths and misconceptions about hearing aid technology. Um, a hearing aid will restore my hearing just like glasses correct my vision, and I would say no to that. 
Um, I wear glasses. Unless I break my glasses, I'm probably not going to go back to the optician uh, for a year. Um, we let patients know that it's important that we see them for at least two to three visits during the six-week adjustment period. That's automatic with uh, any new fitting. And then after that, we recommend about three to four visits per year. One of those would be an annual hearing test. And of course, we could adjust the prescription in the hearing aid according to any changes in their uh, hearing profile. And then uh, the other two would be for uh, tuning and adjustments, okay? Um, a misconception could be that my hearing is normal for my age. As we said before, there's no such thing as normal level of hearing loss for your age. Either you have normal hearing or you don't. I can get by with just one hearing aid even though I have hearing loss in both ears. Um, so typically that would just give you a different problem. It would throw you off balance. It would uh, really take away your ability to localize sound because the way we localize is with two ears working equally. And then also um, it can help the non-aided ear to decrease more quickly through auditory deprivation. Uh, hearing aid can make my hearing worse. Well, if it's not professionally managed, maybe it could. Um, if it's not set for you, if you're using a hearing aid that was passed on to you, maybe from someone that doesn't use it anymore, doesn't need it anymore, if it's not set properly, professionally managed, it could make your hearing worse. Okay, so reflection, ageism, is hearing loss normal at any age? So some different patient experiences. Um, these are some real quotes that patients have said to me during appointments. Uh, they shun me. Uh, this was a lady whose hearing was at the point that her fellow churchgoers avoid having a conversation with her because it's very, very challenging for her to communicate with them because she just needs constant repetition. Um, you're the only person I spoke to today. So this was from one of my front office told me that uh, they called a patient to confirm the appointment and the gentleman kept her on the phone for about 10 minutes just catching up and chatting and then he apologized to her. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry that I kept you for so long. It's just that you're the only person that I spoke to today. Okay, so I think we have to keep in mind that some people really are feeling like they're out there in their own little island and they really need that connection. I have to force myself to hear. So this just um, puts some light on the fact that some people really strain and struggle to hear and they really overwork their brain just to try to understand what's being said. Um, when they say it's not important, it means I'm not important. So this is a patient that told me that sometimes she'll need a family member or someone else to repeat something like three times to her. And then the person, if she's still not getting it, the person will say, oh, forget it, it's not important. And it makes her feel terrible. It makes her feel like she's not important. Um, not important enough for the person to find another way to restate it to her or to repeat it the fourth time. I feel like a real little girl. Okay, this was a, a pediatric patient that we fit with hearing aids and then she uh, you know, felt much more included after that process. Uh, my family's fed up with me. Sometimes a phone call is better than any medicine. And then an example of mishearing or misunderstanding could be uh, Michelangelo painted the 16th chapel instead of the Sistine Chapel. Okay. Um, so this is a true story that a colleague of mine, uh, she's a physician, she told this story at a conference and she, she gave permission for us to relay it. Um, this is about her mom who had a medication error. Uh, her mom combined Celebrex and ibuprofen. Uh, these are both non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which resulted in a GI bleed because she took both at the same time. Uh, she was supposed to discontinue the ibuprofen, but she wanted to be a good patient and adhere to the advice, so she took both. Uh, unfortunately, the res result was that she lost 25% of her blood volume. She became anemic, and it resulted in multiple procedures in order for her uh, to regain her health. Okay. Subsequently, uh, her daughter took her to an audiologist to get her hearing taken care of. After the hearing aid fitting, she was able to have a successful restaurant visit with her mom. They went to a diner and had, a lunch, had lunch, and they were actually able to communicate uh, with less effort. Family members got back into a normal way of interacting with the patient, so it made it easier for the family as well. The patient's demeanor changed. Uh, she was smiling, much more energetic. She stopped talking about being at the end of her meaningful life and stopped talking about taking her life. So their perspective of uh, her daughter was that it really saved her life. 
It was a remarkable visit resulting in uh, a trust relationship between the patient and her provider. And it just means that we all have to look beyond maybe the test results or the patient that's in front of us, maybe even look at the support structure. Sometimes we're not only treating the patient, we're treating the family. Okay, and Cousin Bob. Cousin Bob is a real person. He doesn't look like that, but uh, he does for now for this talk. So Cousin Bob is my mother's cousin. He's about 80 years old. And um, growing up, Cousin Bob would always bring a book to all of our family events and he would say hello when he got there and he would find a corner and sit in a corner and read his book. And then it was time to eat, so he would come to the table and eat, and then he was gone. He would be back in the corner reading his book. And when I was a kid growing up, I really didn't care because he was old and I wasn't, and I just ignored him and left him to himself. But as we got older, I realized that Cousin Bob doesn't hear well, and his way of not dealing with it really um, is to just separate himself from the group. So he physically was present, but he wasn't really including himself. Um, ultimately, he uh, has a cochlear implant now. He's a veteran. He goes to the, the VA in New Jersey. He's doing well, gets very good service there. He has a hearing aid in one side and a cochlear implant on the other side. And he really is doing much, much better. He's much more interactive. And I think many of us could see in our own families or people in our own lives that may be present when we have family gatherings, but maybe they are sitting off to the side or they're sitting at the table, but they're not really participating. Okay, could it be that their hearing is changing and it's too challenging or too frustrating for them to participate? So I think it's, um, it's something really to reflect on. And we talked about not only the fact that we are helping patients, but we're really helping their families and the community. Because when someone has a hearing problem, it's not just a problem that they have, it's really a communication problem, okay? So it really leads to a problem of the greater group. So definitely wanted to thank um, Dr. Uh, Reinhardt and Dr. Donovan for the opportunity to present this and uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you.